interestingly what happened was that that was also the time a lot of these new age hyper local companies were coming up and a couple of them started using the ride safe app to manage their delivery boys and that was a little surprising for us because you know we had made it as a b2c application and here we were seeing startups using it in a b2b use case so when we dive deep there that hey why are you doing that right like uh, why are, what is the reason that the current tools are not working for you that you need to hack together a solution like this and that's when we realized that in supply chain over the last 10 years there has been a lot of progress on solving for visibility right so the startups were not using our app to figure out where their delivery boys were but what they were wanted to do was that what's the point of knowing where they are can we just get an alert if they are at a place they should not be right if they are deviating from going to the kitchen and coming back can we get an alert and that was a very material insight This is Siddharth Talwalia. Welcome to the 100x Entrepreneur Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Prime Venture Partners, an early stage VC fund led by Amit Somani, Shripati Acharya and Sanjay Swami. Prime is often the first institutional investor in category creating tech startups in fintech, SaaS, healthcare and education such as MoneyTap, Happy, Mfine. To know more about Prime, visit primevp.in. Today I have with me Rishit Rastogi, founder of Locus. Welcome, Rishit, to the podcast. Hey, Sadat, glad to be here. So, just to introduce Rishit, he is the co-founder of Locus, a platform that provides proprietary routing, packing, and scheduling algorithms to provide optimized and smart logistical support for e-commerce and delivery companies. And the aim of the service is to reduce logistics cost. Rishit developed the platform. after he realized that life safe an application that uses real time route deviation detection engine that he created to provide a safe commuting experience for him had commercial and business application in other context tell us your journey from bits pilani to locus nishit it's been a very interesting journey very fast paced journey uh, sometimes when i think of it uh i feel both that bits was just yesterday and yet so far back uh graduating from bits pilani i joined amazon where i got a chance to work on the amazon web services platform very specifically the aws machine learning platform interestingly this is where i also met my co-founder geet so both of us come from different school i graduated from bits pilani geet graduated from iit kharagpur and both of us met at amazon we worked together there for a couple of years and as we were building out the aws platform uh we quit our day job to start building right safe which was a women safety app none of both of us had no background in logistics right uh, we were we were just hardcore engineers both by education by profession as well as i would say by hobby we really really liked and enjoyed our engineering and during that time there was a pretty infamous incident that had happened which was where a uber there was a uber passenger her safety was compromised by the driver and most of these incidents happen when the driver takes you somewhere else instead of your destination so to combat that geet and i built out an app called right safe it had a route deviation engine which we used to call r2d2 real time route deviation detection the special thing about this engine was that it did not need a route to detect a route deviation much like a rational human if you tell the engine that hey from the airport i am going my home the algorithm will automatically detect all the potential variations in route and if the driver is taking you somewhere else unsafe now interestingly what happened like we we launched this we got a great response uh this was around the march of 2015 we got a very good adoption among the consumer base a lot of people started using it but interestingly what happened was that that was also the time a lot of these new age hyper local companies were coming up and a couple of them started using the ride safe app to manage their delivery boys and that was a little surprising for us because you know we had made it as a b2c application 
and here we were seeing startups using it in a b2b use case so when we dive deep there that hey why are you doing that right like uh, why are, what is the reason that the current tools are not working for you that you need to hack together a solution like this and that's when we realized that in supply chain over the last 10 years there has been a lot of progress on solving for visibility right so the startups were not using our app to figure out where their delivery boys were but what they were wanted to do was that what's the point of knowing where they are can we just get an alert if they are at a place they should not be right if they are deviating from going to the kitchen and coming back can we get an alert and that was a very material insight that while there has been a lot of solution towards visibility in supply chain there has been very few or very little effort around the decision making in supply chain and that's what locus does locus is a technology platform which brings end to end real world decision making that there is no reason for so many so much amount of manual intervention to happen for taking a package from point a to point b can we come augment all the human decisions and really solve it in a way that's real, that's actually executable on ground fantastic and and uh, who are those early e-commerce adopters and how did you you know then choose to pivot the solution so most of these were uh, hyper local companies or e-commerce companies that were starting up you know often introduced to us by our mutual co-investors right uh the interesting thing was that so for example one of the big decisions we solved for companies is that if today i have 100 packages what is the best way to dispatch them right we thought the problem is as simple as you know you have uh, 100 packages say 10 vehicles let's match them and figure out the best way to dispatch it but that is not what the real life problem is real life problem is more like siddharth i have 100 packages i don't know the number of trucks to use and what should be the size of the trucks and three trucks i already have with me the rest i need to get from the market for that i have four different contracts with service providers these are the rates now tell me how many trucks should i use of what size from what all service providers today but while doing that i also need to factor where does siddharth live not only the traffic and weather how wide the road is over there whether there is a security in your apartment which will add time to the next delivery is there a probability of rain today in your city and what is the number of dispatch trucks that will go on from my dispatch center because every dispatch trucks take time to load right so now over the last 5 to 10 years in supply chain you and i have entered it previously we used to go to a retail store and pull from that supply chain right today most of our packages are pushed to us like an app notification so the underlying supply chain in it has become really really complex at the same time the time to solve it has dramatically reduced 10 years back you will take the entire winters decide the best route for summers for coca cola for that demand and deliver it right but today your demand changes every few hours every few minutes and as we just discussed the the complexity of delivering to a end customer at their home in a one hour slot is 10 times more than delivering to a retail store which is at the same location open throughout the day and to solve this 10 ti- 10x complexity you have one tenth of the time which is really making all of these decisions unsustainable to be done by humans so while previously we were focused on early stage startups what we realize is that given we save in percentages the maximum impact we can bring is in large enterprises with large amount of supply chain because if we are saving 10% the absolute value of 10% is much bigger in large enterprises and that's one of the key pivots or the evolution we made throughout the locus journey that how from the first 3 years while focusing just on the r&d comp- r&d component the algorithm components we evolved that research into an end usable enterprise product like for the first year of locus we had more phd's than sales guys in the team we were one of the few startups 
who were hiring a bunch of PhDs in our early stages because we like what we understood that the problem is that the theoretical research doesn't work on the ground. The on ground complexity is what need to be solved, and that maths was not available. And we needed to invent that maths, and for that we needed to put in that time, right? But in our early days, we were just solving routing as a utility, routing as a problem. Today, we for a large organization, we come in and try and solve their supply chain as a solution. Fantastic! And can you share your early journey uh, in fundraise? Like, did you raise the money for RightSafe or for Locus? The first few Achha, dollars. Well, no, absolutely. Very, very interesting question. Uh, because it was a mix of both. Like we, like we were actually just building out the app. We knew it was a utility. We never knew whether it would be a business or not. And we found some really uh, supportive early stage investors like Sheetal from GrowX, Manish from Pi Ventures, and they gave us, you know, like a few hundred thousand dollars and broadly said, "Don't go back to your job," right? And during the fundraise itself is when we pivoted from a B2C focus right safe to a B2B focus locus. And we received absolutely no resistance from our investors. And I think, you know, as they say that at that stage, they are truly investing in the team. Uh, I think all of our early sta- stage investors really lived that. And they truly supported us from, you know, going from the B2C to the B2B applic- uh, side of things. And then within the B2B, uh, you know, during our early Series A, Shalesh from Xfinity joined us, right? And with his guidance, as well as patience, we took the step of focusing on enterprises because enterprises have really long sales cycles. So as a young startup, imagine, you know, putting in nine months of effort in a sales process where you don't know whether you will get something or not. And because it's a much larger company, your entire leadership is involved in that process, right? Um, So it needs a lot of patience. And that's what uh, we are very thankful to our early stage investors for providing both the guidance as as well as the patience to really build a technology focused as well as an enterprise focused organization. And and how was the experience getting your first enterprise? Was it Unilever or Blue Dot? Which one was the first enterprise which you onboarded? Uh, I I think Unilever would definitely be one of our earliest enterprises, Hindustan Unilever, and uh, it was a roller coaster. Uh, it was done, then it was not done, then it was done, then it was not done, then it was done, then it was not done, and uh, it was a lot of learning experience for us as well, because previously we we were used to selling to the teams which will use us, right? and getting us signing from them. But in a large enterprise, there's also a full procurement department that you have to deal with. We completely understand the need for it and the appreciate the reasons it exists, but we had never worked with, you know, worked with them before. So it was a new learning experience for us of the biggest difference basically you have while selling in an enterprise versus selling in a smaller organization, that in an enterprise, you effectively have a buying committee, right? So you have multiple stakeholders in your buying decisions. Whereas in a smaller company, you typically have a single key stakeholder. If you have convinced that person that this is a great solution for her or him, it's amazing. In an enterprise, that needs to be a multi-pronged approach. And that's that's a process, that's a methodology that, that's very learnable as well. But the first time it just comes as a slight uh, cultural gap to you. And uh, or did it take nine months to close uh, the procurement department of Unilever to finally sign it off? Uh, I mean, not not just the procurement department, but I think overall, like it took us more than a year to really get our first enterprise customer, right? And I won't blame the enterprise at all in it because uh, some of the requirements were of that scale. If anything, I would say that uh, we have found enterprises to be very supportive, like. In our early days, we were not even three years old, which is often a requirement in many large companies to onboard a third party vendor, right? Because they have business continuity concerns. Then at the same time, because these are such good businesses, during say the COVID time, our our clients, you know, in addition to our investors, our clients actually reached out and asked us that if we needed additional capital to survive the pandemic, they will be happy to help. 
right? Fortunately, we were very well capitalized for the next two years. But it was just really heartening to see that belief, that offer, you know, that that extension of support from our client base itself. And uh, in your fundraise, when did you know Bloom and Tiger uh, and Falcon and join in? Sure. So we we first did a seed stage round where basically Manish and Sheetal from GrowX led it. At that point, you know, uh, we got lucky and we were able to onboard some really great angels like Amit Ranjan, who was the founder of SlideShare, uh, Shubham, who's now a VC with Matrix, uh, Ankit Pruti, who's the founder of Unicommerce. So we had like this angel round. And then we had an early Series A where Bloom, Bnext, and Xfinity joined it. And Shalesh, Sanjay, Dirk, we got a ch- great chance to work with them. Manish, and, uh, Shalesh, and Sanjay also sit on our board. So we have been working with them closely. And this was about four years back. Uh, then over the next couple of years, you know, uh, Rocket Ship, uh, which is Anand and Venki from the Valley, they joined our cap table. In addition with uh, Pi Ventures itself, like on earlier, it was Manish as an individual. Uh, then in 2019, at this point, broadly, uh, we had, we had reached our first million. We had a product market fit. We were expanding from smaller customers to the bigger customers. And what was now ready to be tested was, will this product expand beyond India? So that time we set out to raise our Series B. That's where Tiger and Falcon joined it. Then that kind of product, which is while designed for the world, built from India, will it actually play globally, right? So will we go to our 1 to 10 journey, right? And in that, not be able to just get it from the India region, but uh, globally. So that was what was the uh, aim then. And that's what we have really focused on over the last two years in 2019 and 20. And today we have customers, teams and offices present across Jakarta, Ho Chi Minh, uh, Berlin, UK, US and of course India. And we have customers in, you know, another 20 countries. So with more than 50% of our revenue today coming, you know, from outside our home markets, uh, so it's been yeah so that's been the journey over the last couple of years that for us our zero to one million mark was making sure that the product is adding value on the ground right oh, at that point it was all about that that we were paranoid that people should not buy us just for the sake of buying if they're buying and using us is there a measurable change in their supply chain so for example one of the very simple metrics we impact is number of average deliveries you are doing per day per week and automating anything in india and indonesia is far tougher than doing it in say europe or us right because the infrastructure is slightly better so in our zero to one journey we were absolutely focused on whether whether the intellectual property can actually add value on the ground and will people pay for it we did not really care about distribution packaging or you know the uh, anything else the first to five million was building about our sales machinery uh building a demand engine building a product suite around it focusing on things like making it easier to integrate better documentation uh better metrics uh better tracking right and at the same time laying seeds for internationalization both in terms of product as well as gtm And the journey from there has been making sure that we evolve from uh, we evolve from a product with predominantly India's usage to predominantly global usage, right? And that's where we stand today. And uh, from here to our hundred million journey, I think executing our international GTM right will play a very key part. We have a product which really competes really strongly against incubants which have been playing in decades in a trillion dollar industry uh yeah so it's i think now it's about us as as jason lemkin says your first to 10 million is about product and then it's about distribution and that's where we are as an or trying to evolve from a very very technology focused organization 
uh, to a more uh, technology and distribution play. And if you can share a ballpark number, where would be your current ARR? Would it be in 20s million, 10s million or 30s million? Yeah, we are in the double digit million range. And right now is when we are basically uh, working out our strategy and resources to take the 10 to 100 million journey. Got it. Fantastic. And what what, what has been the mindset changes in you as a leader? Please yeah. go ahead. I, I think it's very important. And that's been my personal goal uh, over the last last 300 days that can I evolve from a founder to a CEO, right? And I think the biggest, and of course I'm simplifying it, but the biggest change in that is to move from operating from pure passion to passion plus discipline, right? As an individual, as well as your entire organization. So things like focuses on metrics, focuses on OKRs, fo- focusing on leadership hiring, that becomes an equally big part of my job today. Uh, whereas three years back, 80% of my focus was on product and technology. right? Uh, but today, organization design, uh, as I mentioned, leadership, which involves leadership hiring, the right metrics, collaboration metrics, their own core KPIs, having the right way of tracking them, as well as then interpreting them, right? Uh, And being able to make those decisions. So that's been the biggest change uh, that we have been undergoing and we want to undergo that how do we grow from a founder to a CEO? And the idea is to also inculcate that further in the team that ambition comes from disciplined execution right like we are past the stage where we can just go like oh let's do it uh today we need to have a very clear committed answer in our head as to why we are doing what we are doing and that is what will give us the power to sail through tough times right if we if we very fundamentally understand that hey today we are sitting at the intersection where there is enough macro demand and enough data to make our technology solution feasible. Like Locus could not have been invented 10 years back. Like the team of Locus couldn't build Locus 10 years back. And the fact whether somebody will automate end-to-end supply chain according to us is inevitable, right? So if we have that clarity of purpose, that is what will sail us through, you know, the tough days, the tough weeks, uh, and will keep us motivated to produce greatness every single day. And to pass that through the team, uh, yeah, so that's been some of my core focuses and the transition at a personal level on scaling the organization. Yeah. I also observe in your LinkedIn, you have changed from 2014 to founder and CEO till 2020 and from to 2020 onwards, only CEO of Lucas. That, that I see as a transition. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm not very sure if it's a conscious transition or it's just like, you know, some mistake while updating some details. Uh, I I think you always remain the founder, right? Yeah. Uh, But yes, right now, what what I want to say is that while you always remain the founder, the company needs a CEO. And especially at this scale, like today we operate teams in like three different continents and five different cities. so yeah, the company needs a CEO. One should evolve there, uh, and we are we are we are seeing the impact of that. Like the kind of effort we put in into planning for two thousand twenty one was almost ten x of what we used to do before. Uh, this is making sure that our expenses, our revenues, is far more predictable. And what this does is this is what really frees up your mind space for innovation, right? If you're not worried about fighting fires every single day is when you start thinking about bigger products, bigger, you know, non, non-incremental jumps. So if, if I'm not worried about tracking every random or, you know, if, if I'm, if I'm my mental piece that yes, all the six key metrics are within a 10% deviation level, then my mind space is free to call up my chief of data science and debate on a distributed mapping project. Otherwise, I would always be paranoid or worried about, you know, what's the status of that? What's the status there? And while we are far from being done, I think we took a very uh, big step forward in 2020 
2020 was also the year for us to look inwards given the toughness of the year and yeah that has made locus as an organization far more efficient and predictable which we are really really excited towards you know scaling up in 21 so you mentioned a, a, f- a few uh, very key important points for example earlier you were working out of passion now it's like a lot of discipline has come into your thinking and an action as, as a leader can you share some examples of, of that the changes so uh, previously for example when we would be uh, building a product it, like we, we didn't need to build it to certain infosec standards and things like uh, our average salary cost was significantly less right so we could we could uh, think about trying out building uh, a, a completely new module new product you know 40 50000 dollars spent uh, you know which, which which gets you like about two three engineers for three quarters in that and their working budget right but today we know like our products will take about a year will take a bigger team and they're typically like a like a 750k to a million dollar experiment if i'm doing that i want to make sure that i have at least a range of what is my market sizing for it what kind of customers am i going after are those customers common to my existing customers uh, else i need to start a gtm separately right so your co- as your scale increases your cost of mistakes increases so you want to just reduce the number of mistakes you can never eliminate them because you want to optimize for growth but you want to reduce the number of mistakes you make also in an enterprise company uh any customer facing mistakes have longer sales cycles which you are working with customers who want to grow at 20 to 40% while as a company your growth target is 200 to 300 or 400% right uh, so you need to paralyze your effort and every mistake sets you back by 6 to 9 months so you want to just make sure you're reducing them hiring you know is one of those things that you're always debating that if i'm spending 40 50% of my time in it am i doing it right am i doing it wrong right and the answer is always right in hindsight and always wrong in the current moment but yeah like having the discipline to put that enough attention you know to optimize for like and this comes to very simple tactical things that you know are you optimizing it for uh those hiring calls or you're optimizing it for sales calls in your calendar got it and and what has been the change in how you think about distribution since since, uh now you are at a scale which as you said, right, it requires heavy focus on distribution. Yeah. So there has been two key changes in distribution for us, uh, which we are under way of executing. One, till now, we primarily had a central sales team. Now, sales comprises of your inside sales, marketing, the actual field sales, customer success, solutions, who will the sales engineers and solutions who will actually make the uh, thing live. Now, till now, we primarily had like a central team which was serving multiple regions, uh, while each of the regions had just local direct field service teams. Now, we are creating entire full stack PNL in India, Middle East, Europe, North America, and Southeast Asia, with each of the regions having their own senior leadership heads, uh, their own customer success, their own deployment teams, their own marketing team. The second critical uh, change has been building a partnership and reseller ecosystem. So over the right, a year back, about 95% of our sales were done directly. Today, about 20% of our sales are done with partners. And over the next two years, we want to take that number up to 50%, right? So two key changes. One, making entire region their own autonomous PNL, right? Full stack. Uh, sales team for each of those things so becoming a far more uh, so that you know there is no cannibalization of uh, resources between geographies like if Europe needs to move forward Middle East doesn't need to sacrifice and second to reduce our dependency on just direct sales to also building a large product partners resellers GTM partner ecosystem so those are the two critical ways we are differing in distribution and uh, right now, I believe you would be like aiming for a very large round, up, upwards of $50 million round. 
to take locals to from current double digit to three digit uh, million year are absolutely uh, interestingly we don't need per se a lot of capital because we don't burn a lot of capital uh, we are a pretty revenue generating business and with a lot of inward focus on efficiency in 2020 uh, in uh, last year in 2020 uh, our monthly burn as compared to our monthly revenue is uh, very very healthy having said that uh, we also think there is solid potential for expansion both in the geographies that we are playing in as well as in terms of certain product acquisitions so yes we are looking uh, you know at, at at a at a healthy round which allows us to go from the entire 10 to 100 million journey without needing any additional capital and, and uh, tell us about you know how the culture of locus has evolved over a period of time like is is there a benchmark which you measure yourself to among you know the cultural standards that you have set so locus started out by everybody actually living in in the same house uh and as we so we so basically i had when geet and i started i requested my then flatmate to move out so geet could move in and we both started working uh, from the hall while sleeping in the bedroom and we realized that's a really efficient way of working so when the third fourth guy came in we just rented one more flat and that actually kept going for the first uh, 15 people and by the end of it you know we were almost like running like a nine room fully functioning hotel uh you know fully serviced hotel and so we started out with a really really close cult uh not only did we know each other we knew each other's families you know each other's significant other uh from there now we have grown to a team of 200 uh split across six cities three continents a majority of the team focused in uh, stay in bangalore with uh, sales team spread across as i was mentioning a little earlier in jakarta ho chi minh berlin uk north america we had three three very critical uh, things that we always used to emphasize while hiring which was ambition commitment and integrity now those are not just like uh, why 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 i'm just hesitating here is that those are not like words on walls at locus right those are something that we imbibe in every day like a designer is completely free and empowered to go to a skip or a skip skip level manager or even the svp of the product and say that hey this piece of my design does not reflect quality right like i am taking a shortcut here that you need to give me time to clear this technical debt at least within this quarter right i understand if you want to do something for the release similarly you know an engineering manager can go to the engineer and say that you know you're not building unit test and that's not building integral code right like this is not a qs job to find and fix there an additional layer so what has never changed at locus is that ent- really really strong focus at technology and innovation we want to make sure that we always continue to add value for the customer so our customer success is encouraged to clearly communicate to the customer when the mistake was ours if we went down or if there was a bug on our side of the things they should say that very very transparently we fundamentally believe that we are we are an optimizing company siddhat right so we are in a value creating game in any negotiation of locus nobody should walk away unhappy like this is not like you know life is not a zero sum game there are certain zero sum games but we are an optimization company like even in a pricing conversation whatever price we are taking from you you should be saving more money than that right so it's always a win win argument and most zero sum conversations can yeah. be converted into you know a value conversation and that's what been always a focus at locus that can we can we add strong actual genuine measurable value to our customers there is there are lots of ways to do that our way to do that is via technology so i was very clear even in school early days of college that i want to start up and what i was clear was that i want to build a technology startup i'm i'm pretty agnostic on the problem like you know the problem domain we solve for and we think we think it's an incredibly hard problem to say make money while selling t-shirts but that's not a business locus wanted to build we wanted to be very clear about being a techno like you know a technology first startup why not because of anything virtuous 
simply because both the founders were personally very passionate and interested in that's what brings us peace that's what really brings us enjoyment right and can we solve a business problem through that piece the third was around ambition and integrity that like it has taken a lot of things from a lot of people like you know uh, all, all the early stage uh, early team at locus and even the current team right like no one can blame us to live a balanced life often right we have missed family events uh, we have missed uh, you know births of our nephew nieces uh, in some cases you know people closer like we have not been there for our friends and family at times so it has taken a lot of personal toll from everyone uh, this is not just our place of worship this is our religion as well and one thing that's why we strongly push forward to all team members is to build this with integrity right uh, you don't need to pay anything under the table to win a contract to the fact that you should write your own utils right so integrity goes across every single thing that you do it is really not about lack of opportunity right it's about doing things that you do when nobody else is watching right uh yeah so that's what how i would define the entire culture at locus uh it's a very honest zero faff thing focused on technology focused on making sure that we are actually adding a value add over any vanity metric and that we are doing that by solving hard problems right ambition and integrity is a very equally big component for us like we are not doing it for doing it doing scale for the sake of scale got it and and tell us about you know some of the recent processes that you have adopted because now you are a team spread across three continents and it's uh unimaginable to 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 scale without processes so it will be very helpful for the startups which are you know seeing growing, growing pains to learn from you so at locus uh, we have this concept of yes process but no policy right process and policies are two different things process is a understanding it's a method policy is a hard rule right lack of process is what leads to policy so a, a great example being that we have locus has an expense process that you should know what email id to send your invoice to but we actually don't have an expense policy we trust every individual to judge themselves what should be fileable if you file it we will expense it right but there is a very clear portal or an email id to do that piece so that's process now one of the processes that we have recently implemented that i'm very bullish on is the entire concept of okr objective key results right this is not something very fundamentally different from the, what many people do it just structures it often slightly better what this does is for us at least what this does is this for every individual this ties what they are doing on a day on day basis to what are the key annual goals for the company like at any given point any individual in your company should be able to answer by doing what they are doing how it does how does it help their team and how does their help how does their team help their company right so we have these five annual goals this year for example for each of those annual goals various department have their own goals for those goals individual have their own goals right so that was that was a big process that we uh, spent a lot of time in last q4 and this gives this gives a, apart from tracking and alignment which are the very obvious gains from it this gives a lot of purpose to every individual in your team which i think is very important as you scale the team see what happens is when you are 30 40 50 um, even the founders are just on an everyday basis interacting with everyone so everyone knows exactly why they are doing what they are doing but that is the part that gets lost when you are scaling and that is really really important and you know so like for example last q4 during the festive season we wrote a custom letter to each of our team members family that how their team members are helping their teams and how their teams are helping their company right if everyone in your company can answer these two question at the drop of a hat and answer it even better hopefully in terms of metrics then i think you have done the okr piece right and where did you learn this okr from like uh, did you learn it from a book or you had a organization or a mentor to teach you the okr system 
uh, we learned it with readings online. Like, uh, you know, the the founders themselves have put in like a lot of, uh, uh, like, you know, guys who made OKRs and it's like solid company starting from the days of Intel, right? They have put in themselves, their views are, it's, 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 yeah, it's very understandable. Uh, I'm sure we could have benefited from an expert, uh, but at that point, yeah, we thought this is something we want to understand first ourselves very deeply and we did it ourselves. There's a legendary book on OKR called by John Doerr. Uh, measure what that's the one matters. yeah yeah that's the one we followed as well right like that's what like it's some really like that no, it's really great books by the people who came up with this right yeah. so you have their first motivations right i mean we oh, also have yeah. not answered every every single thing in it right so for example uh over there that book on the google it mentions that in the google they don't link okrs with appraisals because that impacts um, uh, ambitious goals we we haven't done it that way right now we have linked it and we are more like you know it's fine if you reach 70 80 percent uh but what you do should be linked yeah so those are things that we would also love to debate someday with you know somebody uh who has far more experience implementing yeah so it's not a perfect implementation the first time but yeah getting started is better than not having it and uh, and see the whole the whole you know as the other book by ben horowitz says that the hard thing about hard things is that there is no pattern. Yes. And that's the difference, say, you know, b- between building your company and building your body. I think both are both involve a lot of hard work and one should not trivialize any. Uh, but in the first one, there is still relatively a playbook available. In the other one, you know, you need to make sure that you're making decisions which are relevant to you at that point, in that situation, which might be unique. And, uh, you know, one last question, you know, before we conclude the podcast, what are the resources that you have leveraged or books uh, that help you grow as a CEO? Yeah, I used to read a lot of Paul Graham essays, right? And that's what uh, gave me a lot of guidance in starting up itself, like in the entire zero to one phase. um, I think one of the things that really uh, helped me were all the long form essays by Paul Graham, right? Uh, including things on, you know, tangential topics like uh, popularity, lisp, everything. But those PG essays were really, really helpful. I think from the 1 to 10 journey, now this is not really a book on startups, uh, but there's a book called A Man's Search for the Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Um, it's, it's, it's It's a pretty intense book. It's a small book, 100 odd pages types. It's about the Holocaust and the prisoners of war. And it talks about a concept called Stockdale Paradox. This concept is also quoted by Jim C. Collins in Good to Great. And that's something that has stayed with me a lot and has guided some of the daily things. What this talks about, so during the prisoner of war, the people who never came out were both the optimist as well as the pessimist. Right? What, what it required to survive that is a reality check that yes, my current conditions are tough. It will take me a lot of effort to get out. But I will get out and once I get out, it will be worth it. Right? So having that, having that courage to accept the reality as is and then having the faith and optimism to, you know, build and come out of it. uh, I think that's, that's really important. Having like blind optimism that, you know, Oh, competition doesn't matter. No, nothing else matters, and everything will be good. No customer will ever churn. No, no team member will ever leave. I think that's also very delusional. And ob- obviously, pessimism is not something any founder can live with. So having that right balance and uh, yeah, or just knowing that there is the need of that right balance, right? So just that small piece of reading really stayed with me. It's a yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Nishit. It's been wonderful to have you on the podcast. You know, it's a complete honor to to learn from you and to share those learnings with the listeners. Absolutely, Siddharth. It, it, was, it was an absolute pleasure talking to you and thanks for taking the time in doing so.